this podcast and every other podcast that I make is brought to you by Patreon. If you want to suggest upcoming guests for this show or submit questions for me to ask them, you can do all of that on Patreon. Plus, it is the only place that you can get the audio version of this show and it's completely ad free. So if you'd like to support this somewhat niche, but hopefully very informative and fun content, check out patreon.com slash charlamazard. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of video game voice acting or voice acting 101. I haven't decided yet, I'm Alana. <laughs> this is my friend, Matthew Mercer. Matt, um, who are you exactly? What are you doing here? Uh, that's that's a very existential question mm. that I, well, I'm still trying to find the answer to. <laughs> uh, yes, I am. I am an American voice actor uh, for video games, cartoons, and whatever, whatever else in between, I guess. Um, and I also do fun, nerdy stuff on the internet, and uh, that's kind of the quick and dirty of it all. But I'm also a huge nerd, so kind of got to be right. I feel like that kind of hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, like, even if you if you come into this as, and I, and I know a number of people who've come into the industry from the professional theater direction, or, you know, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm a serious on-camera actor. Mm -hmm. And then they start getting into the video game process and the development cycle and playing them and going, oh, no, I've I've already pre-ordered this infectious. system. And I have my Steam Deck now that I have on my on the volume when we're doing mocap. And you're like, oh, <laughs> oh, you, you caught the bug. You thought you'd stay away. We'll get you every <laughs> single time. Um, yeah. For anyone who's not familiar with your work, your list of credits is too long. It's too long. You got to stop. There's too many credits. It's absurd. But uh, you okay. just throw some, right. some of your favorites out. What are, what's, what are some of the favorite characters that you've, you've voiced? This is where it ends. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, well, I voice uh, Cassidy. Uh, in Overwatch and Overwatch 2. That's one that a lot of people are familiar with. The good old cowboy character y'all used to hearing around. Um, let's see what I can talk about. I have a lot of fun stuff that's in the wings under NDA. That, uh, that's good. We love a working perfect. actor. We're in support He's of a working good. actor. It's perfect. Um, other things people might know me as far as uh, uh, recent video games, Persona 5, I voice uh, uh, Yusuke Kitagawa, the soft artist boy. Um, I'm actually having to look at my credits here because I'm trying to remember what the hell. There are too I, many. I said what I said. I'm sorry. I do love uh, uh, a Persona Five. Uh, it's it's, uh, it, uh, that's, it's, it's coming out game. on Xbox very soon too, which is probably going to be pretty cool. I think the first time that Atlas has put any games in that series on um, Xbox, which is super exciting. You're getting a whole new audience. Of that's people. true. That's true. Oh, other things people I know me about. Uh, the recent release, Cyberpunk Edge Runners on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I voice Falco, the driver on that one. Very good. The good old Southern boy. Uh, Blood of Zeus on Netflix. I'm Hermes. Uh, for anime fans out there, I'm Trafalgar Law in One Piece, as well as Levi in Attack on Titan. And uh, mostly, guess... mostly indie projects. Then it's mostly like yeah. little, yeah. Just like not quite IPs, just like kind of little tiny, up and coming projects. Is what we yeah. call those. And the, and one that I'm really, really, really proud of is uh, The Legend of Vox Machina on Amazon Prime, of which course. is a series based on our D&D game that I get to voice a number of characters. Yeah, in, how so. did that come about? That's nuts. Was that like an idea that you had or did somebody approach you about that? Uh, well, uh, yeah. the the original impetus for our, our Critical Role, which for those who aren't familiar with uh, me and a bunch of other voice actor friends of mine in the industry started playing D&D at home 10 years ago. Uh, and I've been playing D&D since I was a little kid, a teenager at least. And uh we had the opportunity to start streaming it. We were like, okay, but no one's going to watch it. It's four hours at a time of us just sitting around a table, <laughs> making up stuff and rolling dice. And we were very wrong. And it Isn't turned it into... is the most successful Twitch channel? Uh, I, it is definitely the most subscribed. That's uh, nuts. Which is wild. Yeah. Uh, uh, mind you, we're dividing it amongst a company of many, many people. Yeah, but still, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> you kind of imagine that to be a thing when you when you started out. How impressive. No, not at all. So cool. It's, I'm, I'm ever grateful and and pinching myself that we have this the opportunities that we have with this but uh as it grew we tried pitching around the idea of taking these stories from our campaign that we played and turning it into animated form and every place that we pitched it at went i don't get it like, <laughs> oh, we went to kickstarter and asked if our community could support us in doing a 22 minute pilot for 750k which is a big ask mm -hmm. and uh we ended up raising over 11 million dollars <laughs> Wild. And funded an entire season one. And then once that happened, a lot of the people that we talked to the first round started coming back around going, hey, yo, what do you Wait, didn't know there's this money thing. in this? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so the, the, the folks that were the, the most 
uh, pleasant and and willing to make it a partnership as opposed to an ownership, you know, yeah. scenario was was the Prime Video folks, and so we they picked it up for two seasons actually. The first season that was funded, and then they funded a second season with additional episodes. And then we just got greenlit for a third season that we got to announce recently. So, I feel like excited. the coolest thing about Critical Role is that it it still through all of the time that you've been doing it and how much of like a big company it's become is you all clearly really enjoy what you're doing. And I feel like people really lose that thread along the way. And it's so it's, you know, again, as big as you are, it's really nice to see everybody succeeding because you're all just having a good time and it's really positive vibes. And it's like always so engaging and it's hard not to root for you all. Thank you. And I, it's, it's not easy. Like, no. you know, on, on this scale, trust me, every step of the way, that's our biggest fear. Because as you said, like, there are so many examples of something that started genuine and joyful yeah. and have it grow to the point where it squeezes all that joy out. Oh, of yeah. it. And so every step we take, we're all checking in with each other. We're meticulous in ensuring that we're all on the same page. We carve out as much time as we can to spend together. And when we do play at that table, like that's our sacred time of the week where we do get a chance to just you know, shed the rest of the responsibilities and worries of the world and just be friends together for the next four hours. So uh, it's it's not easy. The world definitely wants you to wants you to squeeze all the joy out of the things that become successful. Sure. And we are we are doing our damnedest at every turn to give it the finger. Is that very nice? <laughs> Is that your first foray into a more production side of things, working on the animated series? Uh, for for animation, yes. Um, I worked for a number of years in the video game industry on the dev side, and that kind of helped me no understand. Uh, funnily enough, I worked for a little bit at Sony Santa Monica what? Studio, where you now work. That's me. Uh, yeah, I had no idea. That's I, really cool. I worked as a, the QA manager for a short time on the at the end of God of War 1 and the per- development of God of War 2 no under way. Corey. Yeah, of course. Uh, back when he was just a producer. Wasn't he director uh, on God of War 2? He, he eventually became yeah, director. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's wild. But, I had no idea. There you go. Yes. So, so that was how different is all of that now? Like if that's the experience you've had of going from QA manager in game dev to, I guess, full-time voice actor to then Critical Role being this huge company that now has an animated show. Like, do you feel like all of the different parts of, of the work that you do inform the others or do they sometimes detract? I don't think they detract at all. If anything, it helps me appreciate the scale of effort and energy that goes into the creation of something I get a chance to work on. Mm-hmm. You know, a video game for a voice actor is a very solitary experience often. And you, you know, between the occasional writer and producer and, of course, the director you're working with, that's your only really no- only real knowledge of what goes into this project. Coming from game development into voiceover, I understand how many people are putting their lives into this. You know, everything from the, the riggers and texture artists to the sound designers to the level designers to even the low-end QA folks that don't get anywhere near the attention and love that they should for how intrinsically important they are to this industry. I, I'm thankful that I have that perspective yeah. so that I can, one, know that I'm just one piece of the tapestry that makes the game great, not to undersell the talent that we do as voice actors, but I also want to always remind myself that many other people deserve a lot of attention and and love for the final product of these games. And then also now going into animation, being eager and excited to learn and meet and engage with all the different departments that end up bringing this series together and making sure they feel appreciated. And yeah, I just... I don't know. I'm 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 very thankful that all the things that I grew up working towards thinking I was going to do on the production side of things, wanting to be an animator, wanting mm-hmm. to be in game design, then eventually just going into voiceover full time, I now have an opportunity to be tangential to that. Yeah. And get to know people who do, do these things that I once wanted to do and let them know that they're appreciated and they're doing a great job. You get to so. learn from them, which is always the best. Learning from people who are good at stuff, great time. Highly recommend. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing makes me happier than realizing I'm surrounded by more talented people in this Always. department that I'm that I'm in. It's it's great. Yeah, I, I definitely very much stand by. If I feel like I know more than other people in the room, then I need to get out of the room and get in a mm. different room for sure. <laughs> True. Always got to learn from people. Um, so this is a question of active voice acting specifically that I I think I've only asked a couple of people, and there's a, a significant variation in answers actually. What form of voice acting? do you find to be the most challenging or are there different challenges like say video game voice acting versus animation voice acting versus anime voice acting? Cause that's certainly a different style too. Like, is there anything that stands out as the hardest or what are some of the differences between the mediums? That's a good question. Um, I wrote it myself. 
You're welcome. Uh, for me, they're they're all they all have overlap, but each has its own unique kind of skill set that you learn as you go into those fields. Anime definitely is a very technical process because not only are you having to be present and mindful of the script and the dialogue and be present in the scene and trying their best to live and perform honestly as to what the the animation already calls for you, but you're having to take all that that raw emotion and that place that you're existing in in your imagination and bring that authentic performance while fitting it into this already rigid box mm. that's been built and has no more room to expand or anything. So it's, you're having to match timing and beats of animation uh, rapidly. So it's, it's kind of learning how to split your mind into two different parts. One mm. is the authentic performer and the other one's kind of like a, I don't know, a program running in the background that's keeping tabs on timing in beats and you know the, the limitations of your recording space per line. So I find that people who have a music background or at least have an appreciation for music tend to no fit way. well into anime wow, because you have really that sense of timing. Huh. Yeah. I wouldn't have guessed. I wonder if that's a teachable thing. Like, do you think that that's something that you just learn over time or is there a specific thing that you could like teach someone if they want to get into anime voice acting specifically? I think you can teach it. I, I think I think people naturally have a knack for it if they have like a musical background yeah. or at least, you know, uh, have, have toyed in those spaces. But I think it's very much teachable. It is a rhythm. Mm. It's learning and getting a natural instinct for pace. Mm. Uh, listening to a piece of Japanese dialogue, listening to the inflections, not being married to it, finding, a, finding your own natural... Uh, you know, space in that delivery, but also knowing that's roughly two and a half seconds. So this is about wow. a second and second point two that I have to work with. And then just practicing on your own. A lot of it's just recording, listening back, looking at the timing and pace of it. And then eventually you just instinctually begin to feel that, that length process. So then how does that compare to something like video games, where I imagine a lot of the time you are recording before animation is done or you're doing mocap? Yeah, yeah. Well, for for performance capture, it's definitely uh, closer to theater or on camera work. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's closer to theater, hmm. to be honest, because one, you don't have the crutch of costumes and decorated set pieces and lighting to get you into the mood. Plus, you have to like find this this middle ground between very grounded, real cinematic performances that are just slightly enhanced. Hmm. Not so much where it becomes cartoony, but just enough that the capture uh, equipment and the animations can pick up the nuances. Yeah. A lot of on-camera actors that go into performance capture that don't have a theater background, sometimes they end up having, replace, having to replace them after Is it a too while. Muted? They, they're too muted. Wow. They're too used to letting everything live in just like this part mm. of their face, micro expressions. And, and that might be changing now that the technology is catching up with sure. the details and nuances, but there have been many projects where me or other friends have been brought in to replace really high profile performers because just the data capture wasn't getting anything. It makes sense. I read a study not that long ago that said that the number one thing that humans identify as bad acting, even if it's somebody who has no experience with acting, is too many facial expressions. And I think that's an interesting one because a lot of people who get into acting, which I'm sure I've done before too, is you think that to act, you must do everything with you. I'm mad, so I'm doing this, but Crying is a very interesting one, right? Like if you see often a man or a father figure cry on camera, what they're usually conveying if they're a very good actor is a man trying not to cry. That's the yes. thing that tugs at your heart is like, oh, it's not somebody sobbing. It's the somebody trying not to and trying to hold it back that makes you go, oh my God. But I think that as people who aren't trained actors, you're just like, I just got to move my face a lot. So then yeah. you, you translate the lack of movement that probably... Uh, very experienced actors have onto a video game and then it just doesn't show anything at all. And that's that's definitely an interesting problem that would be hard to prepare people for. Yeah, but that's not always the case. Like I said, right. there are a lot of performers who are multi-trained uh, and, yeah. and, and end up finding a really wonderful place to play in that volume. And so that's that's kind of a unique mixture of theater on camera and, and voiceover experience as well, knowing projection and vocal exercise. Um, and then... Uh, that's just per per performance capture. Mm -hmm. Video games also often there's a very solitary experience, yeah. you know, unlike uh, animation, which a lot of prelay animation, you get to record in the room with other actors and everyone gets to play off of your performances and energy and kind of feels like a like a writer's room as much as it is a performance mm -hmm. in some projects. For a lot of video game projects that aren't mocap, you're sitting there staring at an Excel document with hundreds of lines on it and you're just given as much context as the director can fit with the time they have allotted for you to record a certain number of lines they need yeah. in that four hour session. You don't even get the whole and script. No, just wow. little chunks. 
And so there's there's definitely a trust exercise between you and the director and any of the producers that are on the line to cut through all of the context and try and translate the the important emotional beats that you as a performer can take in and bring that authenticity to the performance. And it, once again, helps honestly to be a nerd because you have the context <laughs> for the genre of video game. Mm -hmm. You kind of know the, the level of energy and the type of performance that are being looked for. You know, if you're doing like a, a GTA or a more modern, natural, cinematic grounded performance, you know to keep it that kind of casual breaths, taking, you know, yeah. odd beats and running lines together and, you know, thought, you know, uh, stumbles and things that keep, keep it in that grounded cinematic feel. But if it's, you know, a shadow of war type game where it's all theatrical fantasy, everything has a certain performance pace to it and there must be a grandioseness to what you present. So like, you know, knowing the genres and being Troy a nerd Baker ass directed video game. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know, Troy. I believe Troy did a lot of the direction for both of the Shadow of War and Shadow of Mordor. Um, he did. And it shows, it's very theatrical, <laughs> which is really who he is as a man. <laughs> He, he is a very wonderfully theatrical it's individual. True, it's true. Um, but yeah, like it's so knowing the genres helps a lot in that circumstance. Um, but you are by yourself. And so the people that are really, really good voice actors for video games are the ones that know how to tap into that imagination mm -hmm. to take in minimal direction and then make strong, honest choices based on the, the little tidbits, the, the mm. crumbs of context they can get and make it feel real, make it feel honest. And once again, you're just working with your voice. You can't, you can't rely on micro expressions in the face. So it's it's grounded, with a slight goose to it. Mm. You know, whereas someone can can show in their face and their eyebrows for a very close up tight camera shot in a film. Oh God, we have to run, and have it a completely monotone. But in voiceover, you have to give it that little bit of edge of like, oh God, we have to run. Wow. Still sounds grounded, yeah, but it's just sense. a slight goose. I can't do that. I've done a little bit of video game voice acting. Haven't figured that out yet. Um, I, I believe I'll in keep you. it in mind you. that that's the thing I need to do better, but I'm definitely not good at it. Like, I just go, I don't know, I guess this. <laughs> I, I hear but That's also part of it too. True, but I hear choices a lot. You know, people talk about make a choice. And I feel like that is maybe like an underrepresented piece of acting advice that um, even in auditions, right? I'd be interested to see your take yeah. on this is like, it can be better from my understanding to just commit to a choice, even if it's the wrong one, because then at least you are giving a convincing performance of something, even yeah. if it's incorrect. No. That's, that's entirely correct. Mm. I, I think it's, it's one of those scenarios where, and I've booked projects where my audition wasn't what they were looking for, but the choice I made made them rethink and reconsider the character. Mm. And they ended up liking that change or conversely, my audition may not have been a right for the character, but they liked it for something else right. that they had in the project. And that strong choice is what made them think about it. And it just shows that you are able to, with the, once again, the very little context that often you get with some of these auditions where it's like, you know, 30 year old, born poor, uh, trying to save the world from demons, go. And you're like, <laughs> oh, okay, that's not a lot of context. Super relatable. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so you, you have to create that. You have to create something in that space that at least shows that you know how to make something from nothing. Mm -hmm. Because that already tells the, the casting director that you can take a little bit and run with it. And they'd much rather, much rather have somebody make a bold choice that they can then correct and alter mm -hmm. than somebody that they have a hard time getting anything out of. Yeah. So then to jump completely off of that, for anyone who is interested in getting into voice acting, um, what, what are your biggest tips or, or biggest things that you learned when it comes to the audition process itself? Uh, How do you submit a good off, tape? That's no, that's that's an it's an interesting question because there's there's different theories on what makes a good audition. I've been to workshops in the past where I've heard conflicting information from different casting directors. Yeah. So part of it is you got to make a choice. I had one casting director that was telling me slate in the character voice, you know, because mm -hmm. they want to know right off the bat where you are with this. So they're listening to hundreds of auditions and they're clicking through, and mm. you know you're you don't sound right for it even just the slate. Sometimes they might just skip over and keep going. Another one, but at the same time. Other casting directors have said, slate in your own voice, because if they don't like what you have for the character, they might find something they like in your slate, in your natural speaking voice. An opportunity might... to present two voices. That's interesting. Exactly. Mm. So you kind of, I can't say one's right or the, or the yeah. other. I tend to slate, I tend to slate in the character voice, unless it's a more grounded, realistic, non charactery performance, in which case I'll probably slate in my natural voice to give them that, that hint of variety. Yeah. Um, Sorry, for anyone who doesn't know, what does slate mean? 
sorry, the slate, yes. The slate is when you state your name at the beginning of an audition. And sometimes so they, they make you who, say if you're SAG. Correct. Yeah. You say if you're SAG. Some people have you say what your agency you're with. Some people say what care to say what character you're reading for, mm -hmm. which is more common than not. And some say specifically just say your name and nothing else. You kind of <laughs> make sure you read the emails of the audition too, because some people have very specific instructions on how they want the audio delivered, and you might you might fuck it up if you don't read it right. It's true, because yeah, just following instruction is a big part of getting a job too. Even if your voice is great, they're like, well, you didn't follow the instructions. <laughs> True that. Definitely passed True on a that. few uh, resumes in my time at IGN where people's cover letters had typos. And we were like, listen, we're hiring you as a journalist, as good as all the rest of this was. If I have to <laughs> proofread your cover letter, we're all in for a bad time. A <laughs> little bit of a problem already. A <laughs> little bit of a, a work issue there. Yeah. So, so there's definitely conflicting advice. So I guess all you can really speak to is like what you feel is right or what speaks to you. But like, are there, are there definitely things that you feel like you would recommend to people who are just new to getting into the audition process? Yes. Uh, well, for one, cold reading is so important to the just voiceover in general, because often you don't get the script in advance. Mm -hmm. Often you don't have the time and the opportunity to research and, and read all the material before you go into the booth. So a lot, often you're just interpreting the moment you see it. It's a lot of like, oh, there's a line on the screen. The director comes over the mic and is like, all right, I need an A and a B take and go. And you just have to roll with mm -hmm. it. So Taking dialogue, taking scenes from comic books and graphic novels are great references where it's just quick, snippy dialogue. Mm. Don't read it in advance. Just pick it up to something you're unfamiliar with and then perform the dialogue in that scene. Record yourself doing it, listen back to it, and be like, oh, how do I want to tweak That's that? That's a what great tip. Work? Comic books are a really good example because you're right. It is like really small chunks of dialogue that have action that they often don't say. That's, yeah. that's a really good piece of advice. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, you did it <laughs> I did it another thing I would I would, I think is, is really important advice is bringing the performance to life is more than just reading the words on the audition meaning if you can just read the dialogue that's great and everyone can read the dialogue but consider in your mind what physicality the character is going through as they're doing the scene if it says in the in the in the dial in, or in the, the script you have that they sit down in a chair to confront somebody maybe consider between the lines giving the vocalization of them sitting down in a chair as opposed to going like, hey, we need to talk. You can go, hey, we need to talk. Mm. And just that little bit of physicality, a person listening begins to hear the movement, begins to hear like it's a living space. Mm. If you think a character might jump onto a table, have them go like, <clears throat> that's what I was thinking. You know, you can put these little physical movements, these little pauses, these little beat sighs and reactionary things that aren't written in the dialogue, but that just kind of give it a living, breathing sense to it, especially when it comes to animation and cartoons. Yeah. You know, if you just read a cartoon character saying their dialogue, that's great, but cartoons are very... Well, animated. And so you want to find moments and beats where they can like react and like, well, I, I, they can stumble over the dialogue or they can run up to somebody like, ah, ah, oh, what's going on? You know, I guess that's the line a will point just say, to inspire a director too. They could hear that and be like, oh, I want to animate this. <laughs> like that, that's a really exactly. good, good point. So like, you know, consider what sort of physicality exists outside of what's written on the page. And if there is something written on the page, honor that with some sort of physicality to the performance as well. Don't be afraid to add beats, especially if it's a, a naturalized performance they're looking for, something that feels more cinematic and more grounded. You can take a moment to think about things. Mm. If your character is contemplative, maybe they, uh, maybe they just need to think about it for a second, you know? It's just so fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to voice actors is so fun. We're all a little oh, crazy. It's absolutely true. You're all bonkers, 100%. But it's very entertaining. No, Good, watching people yeah. swap characters like that's really cool. So then, you know, you've got years and years of experience now and you've done a lot of, of characters. What's a challenge that you still feel like you face every day? Because I'm sure you're not now just suddenly challenge free. No, no. Uh, new challenges uh, come all the time. Mm -hmm. Both the the range of characters that you have can adjust with age. Right. You know, I've, I'm doing many, many years of military shouts and Call of Duty games and bestial orcs and monster voices, which I really enjoy, I've noticed over the years, my higher range is slowly vanishing. Mm. And uh, some of the characters and younger sounding things I, I used to be able to do on that range begin to just vanish mm. into the ether like a Thanos snap. So you, uh, you, you learn that as a unique challenge. Yeah. Um, I will say also just the physical exertion that it takes, especially in video games, the 
the sheer volume of combat and combat-centric dialogue that is required for games to feel real, mm. to feel dangerous, to feel like there is threat around you takes a lot of effort, energy, and honestly, uh, trauma to your vocal cords. There was a lot of discussion for many years uh, with the union and with you know publishers and developers of video games to ensure a safer environment for voice actors because a lot of us have taken serious physical damage to our vocal cords, yeah. uh, permanent in some cases. And so, uh, and that's gotten a lot better than it used to be, I will say. I've like, a, it's a very noticeable difference in the industry over the past 10 years, which is wonderful. But it doesn't mean it's less of a challenge to go into uh, a particular game project and see the sheer scale of high intensity, textured, growling yells that they need, you know, a hundred lines in a row yeah. of, and you're just like, okay, this is, this is going to take me out for the next couple of days, you know, What do you to do to prepare for that? Make sure that I don't have anything in the morning or before that session. That's too strenuous. Mm -hmm. Um, Warm up exercises, yep. uh, like singing exercises, things that can get you into a state where you're not just running in cold and then battering your vocal cords. Yeah. Uh, having a lot of tea, a lot of things that can help uh, coat and soothe the throat yep. and, and not being afraid to take breaks. If you feel yourself reaching a threshold, tell the directors, tell the producers. They're more than anything waiting for you to do so because they, can, they, they can't gauge where you are. Only you can gauge your comfort. Mm -hmm. And I know, especially if you're newer to the industry, because I've been there myself as well, where you're like, I'm trying to show off. I can do this all day. I don't want to ever, I want to show them that I'm a professional and I can take it. Honestly, you're just going to hurt yourself. Yeah. And what what little bit of them going, well, that guy was pretty good at that. You'll lose when all of a sudden the last hour of the session, you can't well, the next maintain day, the character. Yeah. Voice. Yeah. Yeah, know your limits so, is certainly uh, a good thing to figure out, which I, yeah, it, it sounds scary when it comes to your voice. Like, do you ever leave a session hoarse? Yes, yes, often. And you just often. have to go home and throat coat? <laughs> yep, throat coat, teas and honey. Yeah. Um, Ninjom pepakoa, which is a... Uh, I have some of that in my a, cupboard. Yep, for those who don't know, it's a, like a... a, a a laquat, uh, like a thick sugary syrup that helps coat the throat. That's been a lifesaver. It's so funny the amount of voice actors who use it that nobody else knows what it is. It, like, I, yeah. yeah, it doesn't even have any, my label doesn't have any English on it. It was after <laughs> no. I did some, I did some uh, multiplayer box for Gears, which didn't get used, which I still think would be very funny that they could, in theory, <laughs> release an Alana Pierce, like, Gears 5 multiplayer because I did it all. Hell yes. But the, <laughs> the problem was, again, I'm not a very good voice actor, so part of it was uh the like stuff that was like um you know when you're downed in gears the character would ask to be picked up like yeah, you have to yeah. be, like pick me up or whatever they kept making fun of me because i just sounded really sad they were like it's still a battlefield you sound so sad and i was like i don't know what else to do so i guess i'm like please help <laughs> like they're like you just sound like you're crying and i was like it'd be very dramatic yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> like, Even soldiers have to really assess exactly. themselves. Exactly. Yeah, I just for some reason kept sounding sad, but it, that does exist. Uh, the coalition, yeah. they have it. They have my Gears mm. Five multiplayer pack. It's out there, but I use a lot of throat code after that. Yeah. That's, yeah. Was, no joke. It was tough. I remember it was actually in one of the one of the Shadow of War games. I think it was maybe Shadow of Mortar, the first one in which I was one of the many orc voices mm -hmm. that any of the various orcs and, you know, trolls you can encounter in the game have. And I remember recording the first, like, two hours of my first session, facial capture in the booth. And they're like, all right, cool. So these, uh, you're, you're in battle, you're screaming at the top of your lungs, you're charging into the enemy and you're threatening them. And I'm going to turn on my gain here to give you an example. It's like, you stupid talk. <laughs> I'm going to skin you right now. <laughs> and so you have two hours of that. Let me finish it. I'm pouring sweat. And my throat's a little raw. We're taking a break and we come back in and the director's like, all right, cool. So that was like the low level barks. Now we're going to take it to the medium level. And I'm like, what? You know, and sometimes that, that happens. And yeah. so you really have to know your limits and you have to be willing to step in and be like, Hey, I know I've only been doing this for 20, 25 minutes after the last break, but I really need to give myself a rest. And 99% of the time, they'll be like, of course, please, we'll take a minute. If somebody says no, you don't want to work with them. Exactly. That 1%, don't, don't, no. don't work with them again. Do you feel like saying <laughs> physically fit is helpful for your job in voice acting? I, I think it doesn't hurt. I don't think it's absolutely True. necessary. You know, I don't, I don't want to judge people's lifestyles and such, but uh, 
For me, I think it helps, especially if you're doing performance capture, mm -hmm. because it is a very physical activity. And a lot of things will be asked of you in those you know, scenarios. But I think also, I mean, a lot of times voiceover is its own physical activity. Right. Your abdominals, like, well, your what core should is you getting... Do your orc there. It was like, that's a, that's a lot of your body that's like going tensing into making that performance a reality. I feel like it's you probably get like sore muscles afterwards. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a whole, especially when you're doing like combat yeah. sounds, impact, pain sounds, that's all based inside your core mm -hmm. and just tensing different muscles and exertions. So I think it, it is its own workout, but uh, mm -hmm. being physically fit does help because it, it just helps your stamina. Uh, it helps you remain energetic over a long period of time through physical activity, especially in projects that are physically demanding. So it, it definitely helps. I don't think it's necessary, but I think it definitely helps. Probably applies to everything in life, to be honest. Kind of. Work out. It's good for your heart. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, on top of that, because I think it's an interesting question to ask, what is something that you think's helped you in your career that is not directly related to acting? Whether it's like consuming other types of media or like, like a great example I got, I do a writing podcast and a person gave a piece of advice recently that was make sure that you work a job that isn't just being a writer. It's hard for people to relate to you and your experiences. If you've been a writer your whole life, go work at McDonald's, go work at a shoe store, like have regular human experiences so that when you're writing your retail work, a character that you might have to write one day, you're at least, you have something believable to draw from. And I found that to be a really interesting, unexpected piece of advice that I definitely would think rings true. Is there anything like acting that, that you would think like one thing that helps you that isn't taught in university or isn't related to the study of right. acting. Well, I mean, you know, just to go off what you were saying, first off, that's awesome advice. Yeah. And I agree with that, even as a performer as well. Um, I spent many years, well, well, the good news is if you're going to become a professional actor full time, you'll be working a lot of odd jobs. That's true. Uh, you may you'll get all that experience. You may be bartending, <laughs> maybe a waitress. It happens. I spent many years as a barista at a Barnes & Noble cafe. I worked for a temp agency and was like, packing shelves in warehouses. Mm -hmm. I was putting t paperwork reports in for environmental agencies. Like you, you, it's good to get that life experience and perspective too. Yeah. Um, but for, I mean, the nerdiest advice I can give, and I, cause Let's it, it worked for Let's me. Let's get nerdier. Play role-playing games, like tabletop role-playing games. I will say my, my confidence to get into voiceover, I would not have had if I hadn't spent so many years dungeon mastering for my D and D games at home. It was through creating these worlds and inhabiting these different characters and giving them varying dialects and personalities and living within a, a character that I created where I wrote down their, their fears and their desires and having to engage my players in a very immediate improvised space where I didn't know what was going to mm. happen next. And then reacting to th what their choices are and living in that space. Uh, a lot of that skill set and a lot of the, those experiences Tr ended up transitioning really well into my acting career. Um, not to mention, I got to build an entire toolbox of voices and dialects and personalities and characters for voiceover that began as non-player characters in my home D&D &D games. That's awesome. Like, there are many characters that I played in video games that have a bloodline to campaigns that I ran at home 10, 15 years ago. So, uh, and even if you if you don't play for a long time, there's something about that wonderful immediacy, that creative space with other people at the table uh, where you just kind of let your imagination take over. You put trust in the other people across from you. And it doesn't happen immediately necessarily. For some people, it could take a little bit of time once your comfort kicks in. But there is a, there's a sparkling moment when you get it, mm. when you give yourself into this imaginary fun, this, this joyful space, and just kind of let yourself go and live as this character and react with other people in the same space that it, it just comes to life. And that sort of joy, that spark is something that you should chase in the booth when you're recording as well. When you're in a good pocket as a performer, when you're working well with the, the directors and the producer and, and to, to get into that comfortable headspace of the character you're performing to where you find that, that realness, that, that kind of that impulsiveness, that immediacy. And then when you see the dialogue and you've been practicing your cold reading, the two come together yeah. to create an immediate, honest performance. So be a nerd, play a tabletop game. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like that's probably a thing that a lot of people underestimate about uh, voice acting. All I can speak to is video games, obviously, but um, is how much work you do have to contribute to crafting the character as well. Of course, somebody's already written a bio. 
the artists have already made the art. They already have written the dialogue in a lot of cases, but that stuff can shift the minute that the right actor is cast and, and you become just a, the collaborative effort of, you know, 20, 50 people. If you include all the animators and programmers as well, it's a lot of people just to make this one character work. And you do have to be a part of that. It's not passive. You can't just show up and speak. You really do have to like care about who they are and get invested in where they're going and how they move and how they speak. And I think that's awesome. And definitely probably D and D plays into that because it, it gives you the sense of working with a team. It's, col yeah. it's collaborative and, and creativity. It is. Uh, one of the joys I, I find in what we get to do with Critical Role sometimes is bring in people who are professional actors and performers, uh, voice actors that we've met through the industry who have not played any role-playing games. Mm. And they're like kind of nervous and like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you're, you're my friend, so I trust you, but I, I, I hope I don't mess it up. And then once they get at that table, once they find that spark moment, they just shine. Mm. And then when it's done, when they, when we go to a break or we're done with our session, they come out like, that was so much fun. This is what we do. Like, this is, <laughs> this is, this is what we all have trained to do, but it's play and there's no pressure. And I'm like, exactly. That's why we love to do it. Yeah. And so to, to that degree, like there, there's ironic, I guess not ironically, but, but surprisingly for some people, uh, a lot of crossover between the joy that you find in voiceover and the joy that you find in tabletop games. Totally. Which came first for you? Uh, were you playing D and D, and that made you want to get into acting, or were you wanted to get into acting before you started playing D and D? Uh, I was playing D and D before I got into acting. It was it was I was a super introverted kid mm -hmm. growing up. I was that. Uh, my nickname was Data in middle school. You know, <laughs> so I was I was helping people finish their homework, and I was just kind of the quiet nerd kid in the corner watching anime with all my other ESL friends. Mm -hmm. Um, who were getting me into Dragon Ball Hell and yeah. nobody else was into it. <laughs> but it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a scenario where through playing role-playing games, I began to find a confidence to even try and perform. I would never have thought about it. And I want to become an animator, mm. uh, be behind the scenes. And it was through role-playing games that I found that confidence and then eventually got into theater in high school. And then the two kind of dovetailed together and just kept feeding each other. And at the same time, I'm a huge video game nerd and a huge anime nerd and saw his voiceover began to grow as a facet of the industry. I was like, oh man, that'd be kind of fun to, to try that out. I doubt it'll ever work out, but you know, at least I can give it a shot and try. And it was definitely a lot of years of small $50 background, you know, yeah. cop number three in this project or whatever. And uh, just eventually hitting the pavement hard. But yeah, I, I, it was my passion for role-playing games that eventually led into the confidence to begin to try for performing as a career. That's awesome. Yeah, I guess that's probably also like people who struggle with social skills. I was also a very introverted, quiet kid. I used drawing, so I would just draw at school mm. and then people would talk to me. <laughs> that's the only way yeah. that I knew how to make friends was I would just draw and then someone would be like, what you drawing? And I'd be like, finally, <laughs> human <laughs> interaction. Hell yeah. And I did that for years. But yeah, I mean, role playing could probably help you build confidence, social skills, all that stuff too. There's definitely a lot of benefits there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure people have asked you this a million times, but because I think people have very different answers and it's always helpful for people to hear who maybe haven't heard your story before. How did you actually get started in acting? Like what, what was the path or what was your first leap? Like how did you get work? I guess is my question. Got you. My very, very first gig was through happenstance. Um, my father was an audio engineer in the industry, not for video games or anything, but he just did a lot of it was called M&E laybacks, which means whenever a, a film would go towards its final elements of production or be going into the foreign language market, he had to lay down the music and effects. That's what M&E stands mm. for. And so you have to lay down the music and effects tracks over the foreign dub or over the existing kind of standard audio track and make sure that it all lines up and send it off to the, uh, the studio sort that's Sort of publishing. mastering? Pretty much, okay. yeah, like, like final stage mastering, okay. something like that. Um, and one of their clients was a company that was doing anime at the time. And the guy who was, for one project my dad was doing the M&E for, the producer was present and the producer was also a musician. My father and was also a musician. And so they kind of bonded over that. They started doing little jam sessions on the weekend. And then my dad started doing background characters because my dad raised me on Warner Brothers cartoons and Tex Avery cartoons and doing character voices. And, you know, I grew up loving Mel Blanc because my father raised me on Looney Tunes. Hmm. Um, so my dad started doing little background voices and he was like, Hey, check it out. Your dad's doing cartoon stuff. I'm like, that's so cool. And then one day he's like, I'm going in to do some background voices on this anime for 50 bucks an hour. Uh, you want to come with me? And I'm like, hell yeah. That's so I awesome. came in and watched him do the first half. And then I was talking to the director. His name was Joe Ramersa. And uh, at the break, they're all doing a little cigarette break. And he's like, you know what? Why don't you come in? And 
we'll have you do a few more voices and like, you seem to be into this, you know, but make your day to like- How old were you? Shout out. I was, uh, I would have been probably 18. That's so cool. What a cool opportunity. It was, it was really freaking cool. And it was like three lines was like, hey, you know, we're like, where's he going? You know, all that, the little background <laughs> wall stuff. stuff. It was a wall. Important stuff. It is. It really is. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, where you, it's where a lot of people cut your teeth. Yeah. And for some people where you make a lot of money if you're in one of those loop groups for like Warner Brothers. Oh, yeah. I have friends who are just full-time loopers. I didn't even know that was a thing until I met somebody who does it full-time. But basically, like, uh, you can explain it better than me. What would a full-time looper be? <laughs> For any of them, any film production that happens, they can't have background voices uh, mixing in with main character dialogues. When you see party scenes, group scenes, anything that has some sort of ambient conversation or, you know, vocal elements in the background, all the background actors are quiet. They're silent. They're just mouthing it. Loop groups then fill that space by, by filling in these dialogue pieces and people who are really good at it. They, go, they work in these professional studios and they are very tight knit groups mm. that like someone has to die. <laughs> for an opening to come in there because they, some of these people work for Warner Brothers and do all the Warner Brothers film properties and they make bank. Yeah, I didn't even know it was a thing and these. you can almost do it full time. Yeah, residuals, man, because it would stack so much. Yeah, because unlike an actor who does like one part on this one film, they're doing like every Warner Brothers film that's in the pipelines. So they get residuals on every Wild. film that goes out there. It's like one of the best kept secrets of the industry. And also it's like a cabal. It's like a, <laughs> like a full on like dark subterranean cult of the voiceover industry. And I'm just like, hey, respect to y'all. I'm going to. You're crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, went in, I went in for an audition for one of those. Like, I guess they had an opening and mm -hmm. I went and met with her name was uh, Barbara Harris, who has been like, she's like the queen of the Warner Brothers uh, uh, loop group mm -hmm. scene. And so I, my agent was like, you have to go to this. This is an opportunity. I'm like, sure, I'll go. And I go and show up to the Warner Brothers lot and meet her and. She's very nice up front. And then she gets very intense. And she's like, oh, so tell me about your background, your history. I'm like, okay, well, I started doing this. She's like, all right, cool. Now you're Texan. I'm like, all right, well, you know, I was just sort of growing up here in high school. And she's like, all right, cool. Now you're English. And of course, you know, I was trying to make my way to the future. She's like, all right, cool. Now you're, you know, Jamaican. I'm like, oh, they just, this is getting weird. <laughs> and, and then she, she brings me into the room to do some looping with the actual group. And as soon as I walk in, like all eyes, <laughs> turn to me like like some sort of hive mind <laughs> like some sort of horror film sequence like uh <laughs> it was intense uh i did of course did not get it and i'm kind of happy because uh it, it was a bit much for me mm -hmm. but but that, that was a they're a very tight-knit community and they make a decent amount of money kind of holding it down so good for them respect to them also a thankless not job just like qa it's like super important you can't have scenes that have just no people talking in the background but they don't get the shout outs like it's just so many exactly. so many people working on, on creative fields yeah, it's an it's an odd spectrum of people in the industry, yeah. um, but uh, I guess to finish the, finish that yes. story, that was kind of my my first gig uh, on that one, and they stopped calling my dad and started calling me back mm. instead. Take that, dad! He, yeah, <laughs> he was like, "I'd be angry if it was anybody else." <laughs> uh, but 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 it was like I'd come in and do wall of voices once every year, once every six months for fifty bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was it was just enough to whet my appetite to make me consider it as a real possibility down the road. Yeah. So it was, it wasn't a, a career I by started, any means. As a writer it was the same. I started volunteer and then I was maybe getting $30 once every month to write something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, maybe I could do this full time one day, but it still took <laughs> yeah. five years before I made any livable wage. Well, and, and to that point, like I see a lot of people that come to this town or any major like performance based, you know, industry town uh, going, I give myself six months and I'm out. And I'm like, that's not going to work. Like it's, you have to love it enough to be willing to trudge through the rejection for a long time. You may mm. get lucky and it'll come sooner. But like there are, my friend Darren DePaul, who is an incredible performer. He's the voice uh, of, he's, he, well, if you look up his stuff, he's he's everywhere. I met him doing Orcs in Warcraft and he's, he's the voice of, uh, uh, Oh, what's this in in doom he's like the ai robot mm -hmm. that oh what is uh, that is um, kind, of, kind of the, the villain yes he's ryan hart in overwatch <sighs> forgetting the name he's, of that robot. doom ai he's robot it's doom 2016 what is his name yeah it's killing me it's killing me mm -hmm. you'll find it it's i believe in you no it's giving me oh weird i just got a, a pop-up on the video from my twitch chat let me turn that off <laughs> Um, it's giving me, I, the first result for Doom AI Robot 2016 is scientists teach machines to hunt and kill humans. What? <laughs> That's not what I was searching uh -huh. for. 
I've completely forgot what his name is. Vega. I'll find Vega. That's it. V E G A. I think it's his name. There we are. Yes. Hello, I am Vega, the sentient intelligence assigned to Moz. That's it. Samuel Hayden. That's what it is. The one above it. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's like, he's like the dude is a, he's, he was once living and now he's a robot. Anyway, <laughs> look up Darren DePaul. He's done yes. a billion things and you'll never recognize. He, is, he just has this deep resonant voice. He does monsters, screams, and and just I mean, like Reinhardt. You know, big gentleman voice. He's, he's, a, he's a, a big voice. He's also this this delightful, uh, you know, vest wearing, uh, like completely unassuming uncle of a figure. <laughs> he, and he just, he just looks like this sweet accountant you'd see in like a, like a 1990s film. And he has this huge voice, but he was, you know, doing community theater and doing some stuff in New York for a long time. He didn't start getting into voiceover until he was in his late fifties. And, and he'd been doing it for a long time. And then eventually he just kept trudging for it, met the right person, got on the right project, and his career exploded. So you never know when the opportunity will arise that could really lead to success. So if it's something you're really passionate about, something you really want to get into, you kind of have to be in it for the long haul. Definitely. Because you, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of trying something and failing than not trying and always you know, living with the regret that you never gave it the chance. Yeah. And knowing limits and boundaries is also good because sometimes you might reach a point where you're like, I'm... Maybe this isn't for me. Or maybe you find another passion that excites you more and has more opportunity in that direction and mm -hmm. led you there, but you you find your own path. That's great too. But you can't go in there knowing, ah, I'll give it a little shot and then I'll just bounce out at the first sign of any sort of you know, rejection. Because I will tell you, most of your job as a voice actor is rejection. Yeah, actors have to deal with a lot of rejection and sometimes very impolite rejection. Like you can put your soul into something and submit it and not even hear back, which seems very rude to me. 95% of the time you don't hear back. How which do you is, uh, deal with that as a human? Uh, that, that's, that's actually, this is another good point of, of voiceover advice. Uh, when you finish an audition, let it go. Mm. You, you cannot hang on to the possibility because uh, it'll eat you alive. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that you won't hear about it. So for me, the, the healthier perspective is to get excited for the audition, do the job in the room, do the best you can. And then once you submit it, Forget about it, and then focus on the next opportunity. Yeah, that way, if it doesn't come, you've already you've already let it go. Yeah, if it does come, it's a wonderful surprise. And I will say, I only had one project this past like year year and a half that I held on to, mm. and it was something that was very personal to me. And I put everything into this audition, and then didn't hear anything back for a long time. It was like it was like the one project that I was like. Oh, let it's myself the one that want got it. Away. Yeah. Yeah. So uh it's like, you know, don't don't put yourself in that position to 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 to, to just linger in the space of regret or, or not knowing. Cause and there are also been projects that I've auditioned for. And I'll say like uh, commonly you usually hear back within a month or two mm -hmm. after an audition, sometimes sooner, uh, depending on what stage in production they are. And there have been projects that I auditioned for and then found out I booked it a year and a half later. Whoa. They were just they were like looking for it way earlier in the in the production cycle and then didn't need you until two years of development had gone by. Wow. So you never know when it might come back yeah. as well. So another reason to not hold on to it because you don't want to hold on to it for two years. Yeah, that's a lot of holding on to things. <laughs> that's a lot of stress. Um, yeah. To jump back to your story. So you were, you were getting occasional jobs, $50 here and there. How did you get beyond that point? I, I began doing like bigger parts here and there, like little video game bits. Um, Occasionally, like a bigger meteor piece in, in a, 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 like a, like on an Ace Combat game where I was kind of the narrator for it. Oh, and cool. that felt really cool. Were you finding those jobs through networking or, or I was auditions? finding those jobs through the, I was finding those through auditions for the company that I started doing anime back. Gotcha. Voices. Okay. And then I would meet other people while I was doing early game dev, you know, with some of the developers and stuff. Santa Monica like, Studio. Hi. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I'd be like, hey, so if, well, if you're ever casting anything, and they'd be like, all right, cool. I don't know who you are. Everyone says that. Shut back. up, weird guy. Of course. Get out of exactly. Here. Yeah. And I, and I totally get that. I, I probably was breaking protocol. Still better to say weird. it. Tell people you want to work. I think it's a great <laughs> idea. People are always afraid. Like you have to tell people that you want to do things. Otherwise, how's anyone going to know to help you? Exactly. But to do it respectfully. Because yes. I've, I've yes. had people come up to me that have been very respectful about it. And I'm like, hell yeah. You know what? I'll listen to your stuff. And maybe I'll pass it on to somebody. And people have been very disrespectful about it. And I'm like, <laughs> bye. Doesn't matter how good you are. If you suck to work with, nobody wants to work with you. 
Exactly. Yeah. They, they, I mean, that, that's actually a very good point, especially in this industry. Voiceover, more than a lot of other facets of the industry, I think is very supportive, very positive. And the majority of the people that work in this space are wonderful people. I can't tell you how many times I've been in auditions or friends of mine have been in auditions for uh, something and we finished the audition and told the director, like, I don't think I'm right for this part but I know somebody who I think would be great for it. And we recommend each other for things and then yeah. get excited when they book it. Yep. Um, Writers do the know, same thing. 100%. Exactly. It's like, I'm, I can't write this, but I know someone who can, who's available right now. And then you end up just like making a network of more and more people. And nothing is quite as nice as seeing people that you know have worked hard that are in your circle or outside of your circle succeed. It's great. It always I feels good. Completely agree. And to that point, there are a lot of talented people in these spaces. Mm -hmm. So you can be really talented, and an asshole. Yeah. And the people are just going to pick the other talented people that aren't. Yeah. Because they can make that choice. Yeah. There are a lot of things to pick from. Uh, rarely, rarely does, does an asshole get through. And usually they make it, they, they, the industry knows pretty quickly. Yeah. So like, you know, be kind, be respectful, be appreciative and do the work. That's kind of the, the base of it. But to, to finish your earlier question, uh, I, eventually reached a point, I think it was like 2008, I was working for Infinity Ward on Modern Warfare uh, on the dev side of things and wonderful people there, a lot of friends to this day from You there. also worked on COD 4? I did. I worked on Call of Duty 2 and then the first Modern Warfare. No way, that's so cool. I didn't and like, know. Uh, a bunch of my friends there went to Respawn and then we all keep in contact there and hang out and stuff. So Hell like, yeah, I've, that's I've, awesome. A, a lot of good people there love to Respawn. And the and the, the folks respawn. that are still in Infinity Ward from the back day too. Like oh yeah. You've, You've endured it all. Oh, yeah. Uh, Can't be easy. <laughs> but uh, but I, I just reached a point where I was like, I I wanted to give this a real shot. I don't want to live with the regret of never really putting the effort and energy into it. So I, I saved up for a while, kind of like built a little next egg where I could downsize my life. I quit my job at Infinity Ward um, and then just deep, deeply downsized my, my, my lifestyle and then began to push for auditions, began to go to workshops, began to network and just kind of train myself and better myself and meet people and, and put myself out there. And it wasn't immediate. It took a number of years of occasional getting a gig here and there, meeting people that would bring me in for stuff. And then I began to book a little more. Uh, there was actually one project I worked on. I think it was called, it was like some, something, something the Argonauts. It was like a Jason the Argonauts type game for Xbox that came out in like the late 2000s. Mm -hmm. But a friend of mine who was working at a, a dev studio in Pasadena texted me and was like, hey, they're doing auditions for the game we're working on right now. Do you want me to put you on the list? And I was like, y yes, please. Okay, cool. And they're like, all right, they put me on the list. So I show up this audition. I read for it. Director's really intense, but good. Mm -hmm. And I, I never met them before. And like, cool, having the booth, uh, I do the audition. And they're like, okay, cool. Thank you for that. Also, could you read for this as well? I'm like, sure, I'll do that. Finish that. And then she looks at the, the list and goes, you didn't you didn't put down your agency here because there's a little list for putting down what agency mm -hmm. you're with. And I left it blank because I didn't have one. And I was like, I don't, I don't have an agent. And she went, oh, we're going to change that. Aww. She immediately recommended me to the agent I've had all this time. That's awesome. And also Taft Hartley me on that project as one of the villains that I read for, mm -hmm. which then got me into the, into SAG. And then she's been, her name is Chris Zimmerman. She directed all the Metal Gear games. She directed the Spider-Man game uh, that came out recently. Uh, she's an incredible voice director and I, I'm, I owe a lot of my career to her, honestly, just taking a chance on me. But once again, it's being at the right place at the right time yeah. and networking with people that believe in you so that that person who was a friend of mine knew that this opportunity would arise, that they could reach out to me to pull me in. If yeah. I missed that audition, if, if I hadn't made that friend, I would never have been brought in and met Chris and I wouldn't have had my agent. And who knows what weird career path I would have spun off to at that point. And so, also being open to help. Like I, I kind of mentioned this before, yeah. but I think that's also a huge thing is like there are a lot of people who um, when they're first starting out, especially when you just leave school and you've got straight A's and you feel like you're ready to go and you don't want to accept help. <laughs> and that can be a really yeah. hard hurdle for, I think, a lot of young people to get over too. Is like, you have to be willing to like, let people edit you, let people give you feedback, take feedback and criticism well, which is really hard. Especially if you're in a bad mood, it can be really hard to take criticism. Uh, definitely a learned skill. And also just like, let people give you opportunities and push you in the right direction and help people back. Yeah. And actually that, and to play off of that too, direction is not criticism. Right. Uh, when a director is telling you in the booth, whether it be an audition or an actual professional gig, you might give your all to a performance and they're like, okay, uh, not like that. Or if, if <laughs> they shouldn't say not like that, but some, some Definitely directors, not like directors, whatever the fuck that was. Some directors that are still good directors can be very blunt yeah. and you just have to learn to not take it personally. You're collaborating. 
Yeah, exactly. You're doing the best you can to work together and bring make it the best it can mm-hmm. be. And so you you can't view uh, direction and feedback from the director as criticism. They have more context than you do. Yeah. You know, you only know what you've been given on this project. They may have been directing it for months or even years at this point, and they need a very specific thing to fit in the overall tapestry. Mm-hmm. And so they're and they are rooting for you. They wouldn't have cast you and put through all the time and energy, energy and effort, and money of bringing you into here if they didn't, if they weren't pulling for you to make their job easier and hopefully get home early. Like they <laughs> want you to, they want you to succeed. So know that they're in your corner and any direction, any feedback, any changes or tweaks they're doing is, is that collaboration. Don't take it personally. I, I, that's really important. And that, you know, I, I, I think I've, I've heard people, I mean, there's some directors that are dicks out there and you know, you just kind of deal with it and go on and uh, no, it might bring it up with other voice actors. You'd be like, "Have you had a bad experience with this director?" Yeah. And you'd be like, "Okay, cool." Yeah. And you're like, "Okay, well, I'm not alone yeah. in that." But this, but it's even that's rare too. Like generally, I think most directors in this industry are that I've worked with have been very, very kind and very down for the cause, which is great. How do you deal with um, insecurity? I was going to say, surely you don't have any anymore, but you're still a human. <laughs> How do you deal oh. with like hiding insecurity from coming out through acting? As a person who's riddled with insecurity <laughs> on many stages, I can tell you uh, I'm figuring it out. Still. <laughs> Therapy. Therapy Highly helps. Highly um, uh, I. A lot of it just comes through practice. Uh, practice, 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 practice makes it become a reflexive instinct mm. than a, a scary a direct, thing. Yeah, like like the more energy and effort and the more weight that you put onto it, the more those insecurities will begin to seep in and take over. The more rehearsal, the more practice, the more just study you do and repetition for your skill and your craft, the more you don't have to think about those things. You just kind of let it take over. Mm. The more natural it becomes in that space and the insecurities wash away because instead of focusing on your acting, you're just present and letting it come out of you. Yeah. And that you know, some people might have, and I've seen some people like young people that are instinctually just, that's where they live and that's great. But for, for a lot of people out there that don't have that, it is a skill. It is a trained skill that you can develop through repetition, that you can develop through focus and training over time. I listened to myself, my early years of my career, and I cringe so hard at how I sound and my performances. And I could hear those insecurities in my Mm. performance because I'm, I'm, desperately trying to not let these people down who took a chance on me and not wanting to have these projects come out and have all the feedback be terrible and have the internet just destroy me for my, you know, my, my journeyman experiences in this industry. Uh, But only through kind of pushing beyond that boundary and just focusing on the work and through repetition, can you eventually let go of that tension? And that leaves very little space for the insecurities to take over. That's a great piece of advice. I'm going to ask you one more question before I let you go. Hardest question Ooh. of the evening. Ooh, what you got? Who's your favorite actor and why? Of all time. Mm-hmm. Ever. Alive or dead. <sighs> I said, I, I warned you. I told you it would be tough. Oh, that's so tough. <laughs> <sighs> I... I asked uh, Elias to fix us the same question and he was like, oh, uh, like, I think I asked someone the other day, um, th- like a, a lot of the actors that I asked just say, I don't know, or I don't have one. And I'm like, that's not fair. You have to have somebody that just inspires you, somebody you love in a certain scene in a certain movie. It's got to be someone. I mean, there there are actors that I love, um, but I'd say like, it sounds like such a hackneyed voiceover choice. But I, 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 I did a book report on Mel Blanc in fourth grade because I loved his work in Looney Tunes. So like as, as, a, as a person that brought cartoon characters to life mm-hmm. with his voice, learning about his, his life, his trials and tribulations, like how he came up through that scene and how he's such a, an icon still to this day uh, for voiceover. Like I, there are many performers who I love and I love them in certain roles and I love certain films, but it's rare that there's an individual like him that I can look back and see a bloodline throughout my entire life mm. that I followed his work and inspired by his work. And now to see, you know, people carry on that, that joy and, and expand on the things that he did and live up to that is, is incredible. That's a great answer. One of my favorite so. people to ever exist is Carl Sagan, sort of for oh. a similar reason, just a human who was very smart in a very specific way, but used that intelligence to educate people. 
And I oh, feel yeah. like that's such a good human. You could have just kept that to yourself and made a bunch of money, but you dedicated so much of your life to making sure that everybody else understood this thing you were an expert at. And never stopped oh, being inspired by Carl Sagan. That's a great choice. In particular, he just sort of leaves an important mark on many lives. <laughs> He's here in the room right now. <laughs> Welcome in, Carl. Oh, uh, bless him. I, I, to, to this day, like if, if, if I, if I want, if I need to pick me up, there's a thing it's called Symphony of Science. Yeah. That does these incredible bits of music using clips of Carl yep. Sagan from the original Cosmos, and just uh, something about his voice when it's auto tuned is just such a, such a calming I've effect on Carl me. used Carl Sagan uh, clips while DJing before. For yes, a I reason. love that. <laughs> oh, it's I a love good so time. Um, all right, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Again, I'm sure we could chat forever. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful. I, I love your enthusiasm. It's always just a, exciting to see somebody who's a passionate talk about stuff they're passionate about so thank you no, thank you for having me around this is this is this, this is the shit i love so Hell yeah uh what are you up to right now where can people find you do you have anything you want to promote uh you can find me on twitter at matthew mercer or instagram at matthew mercer vo for those who do the social media thing mm -hmm. uh, uh also you can find us on twitch most thursdays uh, me and a bunch of other fantastic voice actors like Laura Bailey, Travis Willingham, Liam O'Brien, Sam Regal, Marisha Ray, Talison Jaffe, and Ashley Johnson playing Dungeons and Dragons for Critical Role at 7 p.m. Pacific. Cool. Thank you so much. And also, mm -hmm. Legend of Vox Machina on uh, Prime Video. Go check out our cartoon. I heard it's about getting a season three. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's pretty good. laughs> Alrighty. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye. Mwah. Thanks, everybody. Bye.